What's going on? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda, and I have Danny Abdeljabar. Danny, how's it going? I'm chilling as per usual, but today we have a very special guest, so I'm really, really pumped about it. Uh, today we have Zoltan Ishtven. Uh, he is actually running as a Republican to become the next president of the United States of America. So we're really pumped about that. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Zoltan is a Silicon Valley futurist, a transhumanist advocate, and a self-proclaimed science candidate. Uh, before he was running for president, he authored books on science and technology, hundreds of articles you find in outlets like New York Times, Vice, Business Insider, and campaigned to end the idea of death. Zoltan, thanks for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, the policies and things like that, that I'm sure everybody wants to hear, I just want to give the uh, bro historians out there an opportunity to get you to get to know you a little better, you know? Um, so maybe we could start from the beginning. Like, tell us a little bit about your uh, early life and career before getting into this whole politics game. Well, sure. You know, um, I guess I'd always been interested in science fiction and technology and science and those kinds of things as a child. But um, after college, and I went to school in New York City at Columbia University, and I studied philosophy, but after college, um, I got a job working at National Geographic, and it was sort of that dream job where, uh, you know, for about four or five years, I wrote a ton of articles and worked also for the National Geographic Channel, and so, but the, the main thing was that... Um, I covered some war zones and conflict zones, and it really got me thinking about dying and death because some of the stuff I, I did was really, really scary. And um, I had a very close call in Vietnam with a landmine. And it sort a of- A landmine? Just, yeah, after like four years of just hardcore reporting, it was just a little too much for me. So I really kind of went back to my hotel room that night and um, thought about what to do about this problem of death. And then I realized that there's this giant movement out there in America and around the world people trying to uh, solve the issue of death, solve the issue of aging. They're called transhumanists, but they go by a whole bunch of different names. So after that, I came back to America <laughs> and began to kind of join that movement. You know, see it almost like an environmental movement in terms like that. Um, this is, transhumanism is now a, a really large social movement of many millions of people around the world. And, uh, you know, I joined it and be, you know, kind of, wrote a novel called The Transhumanist Wager, started writing articles because, of course, I was a journalist. And uh, that kind of led to running for the presidency and all these other and being sort of a public figure in the movement. But uh, but, you know, it's a lot of people don't realize that there are, you know, not only billions of dollars, but, you know, tens of thousands of amazing scientists trying to overcome the problem of human death. And so that's transhumanism, right? Could you give us like a TLDR, like explain like we're five? What is transhumanism? Sure. Well, transhumanism is a social movement now of tens of millions of people around the world that want to use radical science and technology to change the human being. And they also want to change the human experience. And it can be anything from putting on exoskeleton suits to climb Mount Everest to brain implants in your, you know, your mind that allow you to, you know, interface with the machine, uh, you, know, you know, interfaces in, in different types of AIs or genetic editing, growing a third or a fourth arm or something like that. Whatever it is, though, it's always radical science applied to the human being. And we mean to evolve out of what we are now. Well, that's, that's incredibly interesting. Um, how far away do you think we are for like doing any of this stuff? It sounds a lot like, like sci-fi to me. Well, um, basically everything I just told you can happen to some extent. We've already had, you know, the ability to grow some stuff through stem cells and different things like an extra ear or an extra stump. But we haven't gotten mm -hmm. to the point when you can cut off an arm and replace it through genetic editing yet. But we're getting huh. to that stage, probably will be there within the next one to three years. We already have had, for example, a designer baby born in China. In terms of brain implants, you know, Elon Musk and other kind of uh, these visionary people, entrepreneurs are working in California and companies that already connect your brain to the internet. We've, you know, we've been doing that for five, six years now. Now the question is, when can you go out to Walmart, buy a headset, and be able to think in real time, or, or do this podcast in our head without speaking? Well, probably within five years, we will be able to do that. Huh. You'll be able to buy that kind of equipment um, just at a Walmart. And of course, the other one, exoskeleton technology, you know, with a third of mobility issues with people in America you know, senior citizens and people that don't have functioning legs. Well, they're already using us. The, the, the idea of being in a wheelchair for your rest of your life is, is not even an idea anymore. It's we wheelchair companies are going to be going bankrupt. And it's because exoskeleton technology is allowing people to do different types 
of things that they never thought possible, even if they can't reverse their spinal injury with stem cells or genetic editing, which we'll also be able to do. But more importantly is, you know, exoskeleton suits. There are people that are trying to develop these things where they can run on water um, and then even have competitions. Like Jesus? Running. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, so basically if you if the human being can run 68 or 67, uh, seven miles per hour it would be able to run on water so there are people trying to develop these exoskeleton suits to get humans to be able to do that now can you imagine going for a jog and instead of on the road you're jogging across a lake i mean this is amazing time to be alive that's that's really incredible and i i I was a little bit familiar with the uh, exoskeletons because you know like most technologies i think the idea was kind of started and funded around military right so there's a lot of military application there um so yeah definitely familiar with that i had no idea that we're one to three years away from like turning into goro from mortal Kombat and getting like an extra set of arms or something like that that's crazy (laughs) well yeah i mean there's it's amazing and the bigger problem really and you know this is take the the direction of the podcast a little different is is really is america is quite afraid to use the stuff there's various moratoriums across the you know the spectrum of use of genetic editing and things like that whereas china doesn't have a lot of those restrictions and so right now it seems to be that china is leading the way forward in transhumanist technology because as sort of a secular nation they're not so afraid of it and um, america's kind of falling behind so you know that's why china had the very first designer baby born and not america so this is also another huge issue and of course me running for the presidency this is some of the things that I'm trying to hit on and saying, look, we don't want to fall behind to China. I mean, once you get this technology and you run with it, you're going to be the leader for the rest of you know the century with this stuff until the next great revolution comes out. And that's not where America wants to be. We want to be leading this stuff. I hear that. I hear that. Well, I think that's a really great transition to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the politics of this all. You know, um, I, I was really curious, you know, because transhumanism is definitely like the flagship of your of your campaign, or at least that's the idea that I get from, you know, looking through your your website itself. But uh, also you're looking towards, you know, innovation. Uh, universal basic income is a big point on there. Um, but your political identity, some just, you know, on the face of it seems to be kind of at odds with some of these ideas, or at least maybe you can clear this up for us. You know, as I understand it, uh, at one point you were with the Libertarian Party. I know that you had run, uh, made a gubernatorial run there uh, in California as a Libertarian. And then you made this switch, right? So now you're with the GOP, you know, but the GOP kind of, you know, the, their Wikipedia articles like, you know, supporting lower taxes, free market capitalism, restrictions on immigration, increased military spending, gun rights, restrictions on abortion, so on and so forth. None of this really kind of jives extremely well with, uh, you know, some of your top three points. So, like, I guess my, you know, question is, like, are you secret Democrat? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that I'm a secret Democrat or, you know, it, it's in it. But that said, there's a possibility I could run in some other year as a Democrat. Look, I, I'm not. I just don't even like this idea of two, you know, a duopoly party system. Essentially, is what we have. I hear that, amen, brother. <laughs> I, I, I fit probably the best with the libertarians, but that by no means was perfect either. And the libertarians just didn't really have it together enough, I think, to run, um, you know, and, and win one day. And I'd like to win one day. That'd be great to actually make some real change. But so it's not that I'm not a Republican or or anything like that. Because the truth is, as an entrepreneur, I've had multiple businesses, um, some very successful that. I'm 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 a fiscally conservative person. I like everybody else who has businesses. I don't like too much regulation, if any at all, and I don't want uh, high taxes because it you know hurts the bottom line. So I fit very well when it comes to Republicans like that. It's just where it comes to the socially uh, liberal values. I, I I you know that's where I support. I mean I, I I'm pro choice. I'm pro LGBT. I'm pro open borders for immigration, and and that's where I I don't you know. However, I think the Republicans if given a chance and maybe this won't happen during the trump era but uh if given a chance i think there's a lot of younger republicans out there who are sort of like me who are like well look the bottom line is i'm fiscally conservative and that's that is not changing however is it really worth battling across all these other lines um you know all the time and fighting for these things when we could just let some other people do whatever they want i I just i believe firmly in the rights of adults. Adults should be able to do essentially what they want to do um, all the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, I'm sorry that that doesn't jive very well with Republicans that they want to sort of control <laughs> everything. But, uh-huh. you know, that's really, you know, where I stand. But the fiscally conservative-minded part of me is really, 
I guess, the, the deep down core of who I am after running a number of businesses. And I was hoping Republicans would appreciate that. And beyond that, you know, it's also the idea that whether you're a Democrat or Republican, we're still sort of losing the technology race against China. And if the Republicans want to make a lot of money, why not support some of these radical technologies? We don't want, you know, the environmental movement is totally controlled by the left and the far left. And that's mm -hmm. not where we want transhumanism to end up. We don't want Silicon Valley to be controlled by the far left. We want it to be a balance, you know, and that's how America sure. can move forward. And so I'm out there, you know, one of the few transhumanists who are really on the right saying, look, you know, this is not only about good business. This is about capitalism, about free markets and things like that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, my message falls a lot on deaf ears because as soon as they find out, let's say I'm pro-choice, they're like, mm -hmm. oh, you're not a lib uh, Republican. And you know, the same mm -hmm. thing with the libertarians. As soon as they mm -hmm. find out that I have a few authoritarian measures, they're like, ah, oh, you're not a libertarian. And, you know, so it's really hard to say where I am. I, 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 I support a wider you know, array of ideas um, kind of all based by being fiscally conservative and liking a smaller government. Well, just a segue, just a segue into um – you know, being pro-choice. Now, I saw a pretty interesting thing in your in your uh, in, in your main point about abortion. About I, I'll let you explain it, but if someone didn't want to have a child or if someone didn't want to have a baby, they could put the child in 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 um, artificial womb. And is that is that correct? Yeah. So you know, I, I wrote a big article for this for the New York Times, and I actually broke this story like four years ago for Vice, but. Over the last 10 years, they've been making incredible, um, you know, I guess uh, uh, the journey of developing the artificial womb is getting closer and closer and the strides are getting better and better. And a lot of experts, two different universities think probably by 2021, if not by late 2020, we will start using artificial wombs for preemies born between 22 and 24 weeks. Um, and the reason is because there are millions of kids that die from premature birth every year around the world. So we're talking about really saving a lot. You know, if you're born at 22 weeks, you have an incredibly small chance of survival and you have a higher, you know, really high probability of something being wrong with you. So the artificial womb is this transition that allows you, if you accidentally have to give birth that early, you can put in the artificial womb for three or four weeks or maybe another six weeks. And then that comes out and the child has a very good chance of survival and being very healthy. So this is going to be used like within 12 to 18 months. They've already done a whole bunch of tests and the first human trials are going to be starting very soon. Now, there are about, about 50 million abortions worldwide. And of course, this is one of the most contentious subjects for uh, you know, conservatives that there, there is. If you had a president who really put in a lot of funding and a lot of incentives to develop artificial wombs, you might be able to, at least on the surface, save a lot of these children who otherwise might have been uh, aborted. Now, and the reason is, is because there's probably about 10, maybe 20, maybe 30% of women out there who... They're having an abortion because they don't want to have a child for 18 years. However, if they were given a reasonable option to have an artificial womb take that child, they would probably say, yes, let's go ahead and do that. Now, if you take just 10 or 20 percent of 50 million, you're talking a huge number, 15 million or, you know, around 10 million children. So <clears throat> putting forth artificial wombs is a huge interest from the Catholic Church, from conservative attorneys, and people like that saying, wow, wait a sec, this changes how we look at the Roe versus Wade decision. Because if you can take an aborted child, let's say at 10 weeks or 16 weeks, and have a choice to put it somewhere else, it might change the debate. There might be a third option. And again, like I said, this technology is not just something far in the future. We're talking about within 12 months, having some of the very first human trials occurring in major universities in America. So this is a huge way to relook at the abortion debate and maybe make some progress moving forward. What I found really interesting, have you ever heard the, the expression conservatism is just progressivism uh, driving the speed limit? <laughs> no, I haven't, but that's wonderful. <laughs> um, it's uh, it, it was coined. I think it was coined by this uh, this uh, comedian podcaster named Michael Malice. And what I've noticed, and maybe it's just because I live in New York, which is kind of a liberal. Danny and I both are from New York, that are kind of a liberal echo chamber in many in many regards. And even Republicans are more in a, are, are in a more liberal side. They're getting a lot more progressive, and they're getting a lot more you know, however you want to say it, they're getting more socially liberal. And I find a lot more Republicans are actually becoming pro pro choice. Uh, nevertheless, there's still big, you know, there's still big 
segment of the conservative population across the U.S. that is that is pro-life. Um, not to take a position right here. Um, but I feel like that is actually – like I, when I was reading that, I was like, wow, that's interesting. There's a third option, and it's kind of a healthy medium between the left and the right where they, they can come to terms because I never thought of that before. And that was a really interesting thing I saw in your campaign. Now, I, I would love to hear some other, you know, some other – things about your presidential campaign that conservatives or Republicans would find attractive about you? Okay, well, <laughs> you know, that's tough because obviously I have some very <laughs> I know, and I know it's kind ones, of a loaded question. <laughs> and I have some authoritarian ones, and people all love to ask me about them. But, you know, let, let's just get down to, to, I think, probably the ones that really, uh, you know, work the best is I, because I, you know, believe that automation is coming. And um, I'm pretty certain that there are going to be robots all around in the next 10 years doing all sorts of things, taking jobs and whatnot. But the good news, though, is that there's a very good chance a lot of government jobs could be replaced by automation, software and robots as well, which mm, in smaller my opinion, government. <laughs> yes, not only smaller government may be more efficient, but also even better reducing taxes dramatically um, from having to pay these people. And I think we can get to the point when we can actually talk about in a 25 or a 50 year window of complete reduction of taxes, maybe even down to zero. And, you know, I've said it, I would love to do away with the IRS. I have a, a national sales tax, so we do away with income tax. We just have a straight tax across the board. Everybody pays it, rich, poor pay it. I, I don't think it's it's very fair, actually, that the poor don't sometimes pay any taxes whatsoever when it comes to income taxes, and I have to pay quite a bit. So I'd like something that's all across the board. And if the rich want to buy their super jets, let them pay that sales tax. So there's a whole bunch of things that I think would appeal to Republicans, but more importantly is when I talk about my transhumanist angle and you start talking about, wow, really shrinking government through blockchain technology and things like that, we're going to get down to a far lower need for how much money we have, we need to run the country. And that's really where I think a lot of Republicans, you know, like myself, you know, we have, we have ideas across the board. But we're all pretty much grouped together saying lower taxes, smaller government, being fiscally conservative and work hard. These are values that, you know, I share very you know deeply with Republicans. And I think that that resonates with them. Well, since we're on that topic, you know, uh, and there's a lot of things that uh, I definitely want to dig deeper into. But while we're on the topic of reducing government, we've got a friend and a fellow podcaster, Mr. Sue, shout out you, uh, who is real big into the blockchain, uh, real big into cryptocurrency. I know that part of your um, 20 point plan, uh, you know, includes advocating for the use of blockchain tech in government and creating a federal cryptocurrency. So I'm wondering, how do you think blockchain tech uh, and cryptocurrency could you know re help reduce or streamline you know government well i mean the the blockchain is really easy the, the the reason the blockchain would work is because when you talk about real estate transactions you talk about marriage certificates you talk about death certificates everything is to some extent uniform and yet it's done through different counties and different ways different uh, notary systems and this and that whereas all of a sudden if you took a blockchain approach to it you could streamline this entire process and make it so that the taxes were a lot more transparent things could happen much more quickly and uh, you know you could trust the system a lot more now the cryptocurrency is something that could just be tied to uh, you know the dollar, or maybe it could be on its own. It could be just a new way of America creating its own version of wealth. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that you might have cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, or even just a single one to underlay sort of the the federal government in the same way that we have gold as a standard. The, the more complex and the more diverse we have in terms of federal funding and in terms of also just kind of looking at the Federal Reserve. I think the better. So there's no reason not to do something. I mean, it's the exact same reason Facebook is trying to create Libra. Its diversification adds to a, a better platform for whatever kind of thing you're trying to offer. And I think the government could do it as well. And then, you know, then we might not have to worry like which cryptocurrency is going to win this race. Is it Bitcoin or is it this? But it would just be the one that we kind of sanctioned. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of the big banks have said this already because they're like they want to control it. And frankly, you know, I, I like the idea that there are cryptocurrencies that it's kind of like the Wild West. But I also like, you know, if I was running the government, I'd also like to participate in that. And I think our own cryptocurrency could be something that's um, that really, you know, strikes a lot of uh, people as something sensible. That's that's an interesting point. Um, so as a follow up to that, how many bitcoins do you have? 
Uh, well, <laughs> I'll tell you, unfortunately, I, I have almost a whole one, which I mm -hmm. have stupidly lost all the information to. So somewhere it's out there, um, but I have no <laughs> access to it. Uh, I, I, still have the, I still have the computer, though, that has it on somewhere. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's, you know, I could get someone to do it, but I think it costs about the same amount of money. So unfortunately, I don't have <laughs> anything. I do have a number of little different uh, currencies that because I've been... Um, uh, kind of uh, somebody who's been, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, they ha they asked me to help set up these different cryptocurrencies and these different companies that use these. And so like BitNation is one that I have 3 million of this expat. Unfortunately, it's at 0.2 right now. So it's like $82. <laughs> uh, right. It once was worth maybe like 10,000. But, um, you know, so I, I've been uh, on the board of a number of these uh, cryptocurrency things, none which have panned out. But I, I find it fascinating. And I, I'm, uh, you know, I think, Again, I think from just a financial perspective, you never know what's going to hit a home run. And it's wise to hold these things. It's wise to use these things. If there's a complete meltdown in America financial system, I think people that are holding Bitcoin would be very smart to do it. And, um, you know, as a diversification tool as well, it's just like gold and oil. You know, you may not like those things, but it's always wise to hold some type of cryptocurrency um, in case uh, in case things really get bad. Definitely. Um, so let's switch it up a little bit. So we're, we're full into domestic policy. Uh, so I figured I, I'd, I'd ask, you know, kind of your first point on your 20 point plan was amending the constitution. And I, I'm a nerd. So I did a bunch of research on this stuff. Um, and among the, you know, amendments, cause you proposed quite a few, 12 of them, if I counted correctly, um, you want to protect the right to do anything to your body, create a universal basic income, which definitely want to talk about in a bit. Um, Add a balanced budget um, amendment, overturn Citizens United, implement ranked voting uh, on a federal level, lay the groundwork for the rights of other future advanced sapien beings like robots, 3D printed humans and AI. Um, so like a bunch of stuff that you're proposing here. Uh, so I, I went and dug into like the amendments, right? So we've had 27 of them not included in those 27 or like six that never panned out. Uh, one of the 27 got repealed. Ten of them were put in place in 1795, so it's like more than a third. Uh, and the last one, the 27th, uh, took 200 years to be ratified. Um, so I did some math and controlling for that last one and the first 10 that came out all at once. On average, it looks like we get an amendment about every 12 to 13 years, though it doesn't actually work out that way in practice. You know, you get these like chunks of a bunch of amendments and then a whole bunch of nothing. Um, but uh, it takes on average one to two years to ratify an amendment once it's been submitted, right? And this holds true for all of them except for that one that took 200 years. Uh, so it's been almost 28 years since our last amendment was ratified. And it's been 50 years since a brand new one has been submitted and ratified. So like by my math, we're overdue for, I don't know, two to four amendments. And given the that like average time span between that submission and that ratification, I think it's statistically likely that the next person to win in 2020 could bring about at least one amendment. So let's say you win in 2020. Given a relatively productive Congress, which probably won't happen, I'll give you three amendments that you could submit in your first term that will get passed. Which do you pick? Well, I think the very first one is morphological freedom. This concept that you should be able to do anything to your body that you want to do so long as it doesn't harm somebody else. And the reason this is really important is as we enter this transhumanist age, especially with like all these companies working on brain implants as, as a way to you know stave off a of sort of the, the, the automation, the robot revolution, we're going to need permission to do these things to ourselves, but we can't have permission from the fda we need permission from the, the it's as an inherent right as opposed to the fda taking 10 years every single time to approve something especially when china is approving these things in two or three or four years you know in order to keep up with the modern world and the way the microprocessor is evolving Every single American just simply needs the right to do things to their body, especially as biohacking and citizen science becomes, you know, ever more powerful and people have access to genetic editing in their in their garage just through a thousand dollar eBay kit. You know, so I think people should have the right to do that. And that's a very, you know, that's a very simple one. Um, I think the second one is is we'll talk about this maybe more a bit later. But I think the, um, you know, the second one could be this universal basic income. And, and I'll explain why. And the reason is. We're coming to an age when America thinks it's going to last for thousands of years. And, and honestly, I just think that's that's BS. That's the idea that 
humans are going to make it out of the 21st century as biological entities living in a country that has a constitution uh, from 250 years ago, talking about muskets and Second Amendment and all this other stuff. This is totally insane. I mean, we're at the verge of changing who we are. We're at the verge of connecting our brain to the internet, uploading ourselves, uh, replacing limbs with bionic arms that throw footballs five miles in perfect accuracy. I mean, we're at the age. This is gonna all gonna be happening in 10, 20 years. Then there's genetic editing. Then there's even quantum computing. We didn't even talk about the cryptocurrency thing. You know, they're talking about Google's quantum computer in two seconds, discovering every single Bitcoin that's left unmined in two seconds, two seconds. I mean. What does that happen to the cryptocurrency market? Well, it's gone. So uh, we're what I'm trying to say is we're talking about immensely different types of technologies that completely change the structure of humanity. We're going to need to make those progress soon. And the reason I support a universal basic income is because my federal land dividend, which monetizes the federal land that's in America, of which we have 150, maybe $200 trillion worth of natural resources, We'll start giving money to the people today and doesn't cost a thing, doesn't raise taxes. Instead of holding on to that land from a thousand years from now when we, people are still believing we're going to be humans, which is totally, uh, in my opinion, insane. We're not going to be humans in a thousand years. There are people that are hungry in America right now. There are people that need an education. There are people that can't afford health care, but they each have some kind of stake in the American wilderness that's out there that's being unused and essentially non-monetized and we can make a universal basic income for every single American if we just would monetize that huge amount of federal land that's out there in America. And just so your listeners know, 50% of the Western 11 U.S. states is empty federal land and most of it, 92% of it has nothing to do with national parks. So it's totally out there unused. So my second amendment would be that we must start utilizing that federal land for the common good of the people. And I don't mean preserve it so a bunch of rich white people can go visit Yosemite. I just was at Yosemite. I mean, we need to use it so that we people in the inner cities actually can get the right kinds of education and utilize it so every America get every American gets their piece of the pie. And look, the Third Amendment, I think, is, is one that, um, you know, it, it's a little bit more nebulous. But I believe that humans have um, a, a commitment, a commitment to protect the species and protect the planet at all costs. And I'm not talking only environmental things, though I think that's part of it, but I mean away from asteroids and I mean away from plagues that kind of like Ebola, and I mean away from nuclear risk and things like that. And right now it'd be great to have an amendment that would say, there is going to be either some type of institution or some kind of commission that spends a certain amount of natural resources to make sure that America really is worried about its safety as a nation as well as the planet's safety. I mean, we, right now we spend like a, a few million dollars looking for asteroids and we spend all these trillions of dollars and everything else when it only takes, we've seen this happen. This isn't like something that might happen. This is an inevitability if you wait long enough. And I just think that it's the government's job to worry about existential risk. And we're not worrying about existential risk enough as a planet. Hold on one second. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Guys, remember those days when you were always ready to go? Well, now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up. BlueChew.com, and that's blue like the color blue. Blue Chew brings you the first chewable with the same FDA-approved active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. You can take them anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach, and since they're chewable, they work up to twice as fast as a pill so you can be ready whenever that opportunity arises. And we know that opportunity comes up a lot for you. If you could benefit from more confidence where it counts, Blue Chew is the fast and easy way to enhance your performance. Blue Chew is prescribed online by licensed physicians, so you don't have to go to the doctor's office or wait in line at the pharmacy. And it ships right to your door in a discreet package. They're made in the USA, and since Blue Chew prepares and ships direct, they're cheaper than a pharmacy. And best of all, no more awkwardness. Right now, we got a special deal for our listeners. Visit BlueChew.com and get your first shipment free. When you use our special promo code BRO, just pay $5 shipping. Again, that's B-L-U-E Chew.com, promo code BRO, to try it free. Blue Chew is the better, cheaper, faster choice, 
and we thank them for sponsoring this podcast. All right, let's get back to it. It's funny that you say that. Our last episode, we had a long conversation about volcanoes and about how there's a volcano under in, in Yellowstone Park, a super <laughs> volcano, that is. Also, side tangent, I wanted to say this for the end, but I heard that you invented or like popularized the sport of volcano boarding. What's up with that? <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, no, I did. And I agree, the volcano in Yellowstone, I love watching the, the conspiracy films about it because it's a very real phenomena that could happen. Um, but uh, volcano boarding was one of the very first projects that sort of actually led to me being a, a public figure because I was working at National Geographic and I told my producer, hey, there's this volcano. I, I'm a snowboarder. It looks just like a ski slope, but except it's in the, the tropics. Do you mind if I film and can we make a TV uh, you know, segment out of it? I was working at the time for National Geographic Today where National Geographic used to have an hour long news show. And they're like, let's do a news piece on it. And so I did it. And all of a sudden that went viral and the entire sport of volcano boarding. But what makes volcano boarding so interesting is that there's a bunch of pumice and kind of lava bombs that are, um, you know, spewing all over. Your, and people get killed from these lava bombs because they're rocks, you know, molten rocks flying all over your head. And so it's very much like Russian roulette. And um, if you can, uh, you know, if you can kind of do it and get down the mountain safely, then you've, you've, you've succeeded. But anyways, as a result, this, you know, these, some of these images, and you can just go Google, uh, <coughs> Google Zoltan Ishvan volcano boarding national geographic, and you'll come to this video. Um, and you know, around this, around the world, this sport launched. Now there's like eight or nine different volcanoes people are doing it on. And it's a whole, it's a whole big sport. Now it's pretty funny. And this, I did this back in 2002. I mean, it's for, you know, for a president, I, I think that's badass. That's not like Telly, Teddy Roosevelt badass. You know, like if you're the president and you volcano board, that's crazy. I can imagine like Secret Service like freaking out for you wanting to do that. Um, but uh, for a transhumanist, you really have a death wish. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of crazy. Well, it's interesting because ESPN contacted me a, a while back about doing it. Now that I'm married and I have two kids, um, mm -hmm. it really is like very, very dangerous. And I don't know if I would do it. I'd have to really like think more about it. I told him at the time I was not interested, <laughs> but uh, maybe now that the kids are a little bit older, I would, but it's funny. Some of the, I've heard that people are wearing sharks, shark mesh suits now to protect. It doesn't necessarily protect from break your bones breaking when a big lava bomb hits you, but it does protect from melting through the metal. So now people like wear huh. almost these like shark mesh suits when they do it down things. And some volcanoes, th they're not exploding. Like there's variations of the sport, but the real, you know, the, the, the real, I guess the best part of the sport is when you do it maybe even inside the lips of Volcano. and cause Like the, in the, the caldera? Is, yeah, you can do it inside and people wear methane masks and everything like that and then they climb back out. And the, the thing is, you have to understand, nope. Volcano, <laughs> they, they shoot out pumice and so the pumice is very similar to snow, like powder snow. And that's why when you see a volcano, like depending on the trade wind, some sides just look like a big giant puff of you know it's like just very very thin sand and so of course if you're a skier or a snowboard it's perfect to go down the only thing you got to watch out for is the explosions you got to watch out for the lava <laughs> yeah that's a bunch of nope for me but, you hear that yeah. perfect place to go snowboarding on your next trip just watch out for the lava <laughs> watch out for the explosions oh man that's extreme <laughs> Uh, let's let's kind of get back to it. You know, um, one of the uh, the big things that, that I'm really excited to talk to you about is that universal basic income. Uh, and you spent you know kind of a bit of a time um, you know on our question about the amendments here. Um, but you write you know widespread automation is coming. Capitalism will be challenged to its core as inequality grows and human labor becomes obsolete with the rise of automation and software. And you kind of touched on this, but I figured we'd bring it back up. You're like, how far do you think? How far away are we before capitalism just really crumbles? Well, definitely, I'd say within 25 years, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's got to crumble because um, if you see some of the Boston Dynamic robots doing flips and oh, yeah, you know, I love like those carry robots. stuff upstairs, up a, a set of stairs. I mean, you know, even three years ago, they weren't able to really carry stuff upstairs and now they can carry it better than 50% of humanity. And pretty soon they're <laughs> going to carry it a better than an Olympian. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the nature of this game. And, and again, you have to realize that the microprocessor is doubling in capacity all the time. And then if something like quantum computing came out and all of a sudden the, the microprocessor got just that much better, we're talking about, you know, I mean, you know, we're talking about having an AI that's smarter than human beings on planet Earth within a decade's time. Probably not that soon, but definitely within the next 25 years, we're going to have machines that simply can do everything better than us. I mean, they can already trade better than us, 
but they're going to be able to be better lawyers. You know, my wife's a doctor. They're going to be able to deliver babies better, except they're going to do it 24 hours a day and they're never going to show up late and they're never going to sue the hospital because they, you know, fell on something. I mean, we're, we're sort of doomed in terms of a species, unless, of course, like I mentioned, the brain implant thing really works out and we could start trading stocks as quickly as a machine interface. But even that's, our biology will probably already sl always slow us down but at least we might be faster. And, but I think it's sort of, and you know, it, it's the end and the companies are that, you know, have robots and automate everything. They're going to be the ones that thrive. And uh, if we don't provide some type of basic income to the people that are massively losing jobs, tens of millions a year, I mean, they're going to revolt. I mean, you don't just get rid of truck drivers. Did you ever meet truck drivers before? First off, these guys are all armed. Second off, these are all tough guys. <laughs> you don't just yeah. replace your job and say, hey, some robot did it. They're going to go with their guns to the nearest, you know, uh, state, uh, state office or something like that and just be pissed off. You need to come up with a solution where they say, you're right, I'd rather receive a basic income and now I can just enjoy, you know, watching TV all day long or maybe I'm going to go back to school or maybe I'm going to go to the Bahamas and learn how to play the guitar all day. But whatever it is, you, you can't just replace people's job and expect them to sit quietly. So a basic income is needed in order for civilization to progress forward so that we don't get a bunch of the masses with their pitchforks. So here's a question i know you probably get this question a lot when talking about this subject but i ha i have to ask it so you know i see uh, one of the amendments is laying the groundwork for rights for the for other future advanced sapient beings like robots and 3d printed humans and ai now here's the question what is to stop these ai from enslaving humanity oh well, the, the, probably nothing and i, I would i would <laughs> say that honestly like that's probably a high scenario situation, which is why I really suggest that we don't create AI that's as smart as us until we have total control over it. In fact, later in my 20 point plan, I talk about it. We need a commission that regulates AI because this Terminator scenario is, it's a great movie. Hey, let me tell you, philosophically, it's totally true. Why would a robot that is programmed to have desires, programmed to want power, programmed to mimic our own brain, say, oh, I'm going to remain a slave Like when, I have, when they have more intellect. The, the good news, though, is that robots, the way their brains work and the way they're probably upgrade themselves based on the internet is they're probably going to upgrade themselves so quickly that, and this is what we call the singularity, that it's very possible that an AI within a year's time might become so powerful once it becomes a full AI that... It's our, it goes from being, you know, twice as smart as us to maybe a million times smarter than us within a, a year's time. It will probably have no desire to to end our lives because it'll be like floating amongst the clouds and the servers and, and already sort of a godlike entity. It'd be like us looking at ants. We don't go and exterminate all the ants, you know, because we just don't even notice them anymore. And that may happen, but the likelihood is probably that. You know, an AI will come and uh, sort of like the Matrix and we'll probably try to shut it down at some point because it'll freak us out. We'll realize that, you know, it's us or them. And, you know, I can't imagine them not winning that just... It, just think about it, like what's been happening, machine intelligence and machine parts, titanium lasts thousands and thousands of years. The bi biology is fragile. It's it's doomed to die. It's it's an imperfect system. Our our hearts can only beat a certain amount of time before we all the entire system fails. You know, these are not things that are gonna happen to cyborgs or machines or robots. If we don't upgrade ourselves and merge with machines, we are absolutely, I think, doomed. Are you just trying to get on the robots' good side before they take over? <laughs> yeah, so that that is that is a, that is one. Uh, there's a couple philosophical arguments. I think Rocco's Basilic is is the main argument that says if you don't help bring uh, a robot god into existence and then it comes into an existence, it may make you suffer for eternity because you did nothing to help it bring, you know, be, become into being. And there's no question at some point we're going to create an AI 
that is almost godlike. And if it was pissed off because we tried to stop it, it might be able to put us into an eternal hell. It gets so like almost Christian like, you know, in, in a way, in the just uh, Abrahamic theology, because this is sort of, you know, what could very well happen within a 25 year time span. But, uh, you know, right now, of course, it's just for uh, having fun and you see this kind of stuff on TV and sci fi. But, uh, these these questions i think are very very real <laughs> definitely and let, let, let's bring it back to earth too you know because before the robot gods can come about we still got to get the robot automation and that's you know coming back to our universal ba- basic income question and i can't leave this unasked you know we got to talk about the costs right i mean you hear people throwing around statistics for ubi you know thousand bucks a month i mean andrew yang's super popular for this particular thing here you know a lot of people say it's 3.8 trillion that's 75 percent of the u.s gdp but that number is like not great because because it's not accounting for, you know, uh, uh, how those costs get offset by money flowing back into the economy, you know, or uh, how we can wipe out other benefits, uh, you know, and eliminate social certain social welfare programs and the savings there. I think a good, more approximate cost some economists have put out is probably $539 billion a year. And that is less than 3% of GDP, but it's still a lot of money, right? And so the typical ways that a lot of people have been proposing UBI, like how do you pay for it, have been raising taxes on people, right? Most popularly, we see, you know, uh, riches, you know, the richest people pay the most and the poorest people pay little to none. You know, for most, you know, the tax increases will, would get offset because, you know, a thousand bucks a month, you know, they're getting it. Everyone's getting it. But there's definitely going to be net winners and net losers. So good luck passing that, right? And then the on the other hand, you can raise taxes on consumption. I mean, this is something that you propose, right? Like a VAT tax or like a tax on data or something like like Andrew Yang would propose. You know, and the estimates on those tax yields vary. Um, but, you know, something I found on Tax Policy Center uh, said that, uh, you know, in 2012, we could have raised, you know, a gross revenue of $356 billion um, through a 5% VAT tax, right? It's not quite enough, but it's definitely a start. But there's some loose ends there. And you're proposing this third option, and I want to hear all about it. Tell me sure, about it. Sure, sure. Yeah, mine doesn't raise taxes, and I you're not going to find me raising taxes for any reason, basically, I think. M- maybe for existential risk, but even then, I think we have other methods to do it. We would take money from the military and then try to wipe out existential risk. But no, I mean, my basic income comes from a very singular source. So just so you understand and your, your listeners understand, America is sitting on approximately 150 to $200 trillion worth of natural resources, whether it's mountains and forests. And, you know, 96%, for example, of the state of Nevada is unused, and most of it is federal land. It has about the same amount of mineral resources that Afghanistan has, except we're fighting wars in Afghanistan, and they say for the people, but I say it's for the mineral resources. We well, have we heard recently mineral... that it wasn't for the people either, so... <laughs> yeah. Well, we have the mineral resources here. We're just not using it because America's, you know, uh, kind of global plan has always been... Let's use other people's first. And that makes a lot of sense. However, in my basic income plan, because automation is coming so quickly and taking is going to be taking away so many jobs, I have said, let, look, here's a great thing. If we divide $150 trillion worth of natural resources by 325 million Americans, every single American is worth almost a half million dollars in equity. Now that we know everyone's worth a half million dollars in equity, how do we monetize that equity so that we can start paying out an interest to that person monthly? So how do we do that? Well, you know, we start trying to lease out the land in Nevada. Say, look, if you're a big giant copper company, go for it. If you're a big uh, giant nickel company, if you're a forestry company, we have forestry over here in California. If you want to use the land for public use, you, you know, do that. The other, when I say public use, I mean, if you want to build, you know, Walmarts and things like that, you can do that. Just take a good look at California's coastline. California's coastline has somewhere between three to five trillion dollars worth of real estate sitting right on the ocean that no developers are able to touch because the California Coastal Commission has said no development. Now, developers are dying to go there and build giant communities there so that we could all have our gorgeous ocean views. And there would be like literally, I don't know how many lots, but hundreds of thousands of lots and worth about three to $5 trillion. Uh, you know, we're, we're starting to talk like that's almost getting close to knocking huge chunks out of the national debt. 
but the California Coastal Commission is not uh, letting this land go out. However, if we were to lease out that land, let's say 99-year leases to developers, they would go wild and build all these brand new communities, sell the land or lease it out, and all that leasing money would go right back to people. Now, California has 25% of Californians, about 13 million, live at right at the poverty line, about $24,000 a year. We have like more homeless people here and more people in poverty than anywhere else in the country. It's, it's a huge travesty. And yet we have so much gorgeous, beautiful, untouched land that developers would pay so much for just to build houses there. Why don't we start taking care of our own people? Why don't we, you know, instead of worrying about the hooted owl or worrying about the wolves, we ought to worry about the children that are going to bed hungry in Louisiana and Kentucky and all these other places. That's what a federal land dividend would do. You would rent out the, the vast amount of federal resources that are out there to big businesses. doesn't matter even if some of them are international. And whatever that they make, they pay a, a, you know, a certain amount of dividend. And that dividend goes right back to the people. doesn't raise taxes whatsoever. And every single person gets it. Not just the poor. But everybody gets it. And of course, it would hopefully swallow Social Security, definitely swallow food stamps, start taking care of Medicare, all these other things. And it's just out there. We just got to go do it. But right now, the environmentalists have us in a chokehold saying, no, we need to preserve this land for thousands of years so that my great, 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 great grandchildren can use it. And here I am saying, wait a sec, there is no more great grandchildren. We're talking about the, you know, becoming a very different species within a 50 or 100 years. Let's use it now and take care of America today. Well, I got to push back on you, Zoltan, man. Uh, you know, honestly, on the face of it, it seems like this is a really great opportunity. But personally, I am worried that, you know, these mega polluting companies are going to come and, you know, uh, they're the, they're basically going to be the only ones with enough buying power and demand to buy up meaningful quantities of land to be able to pay for this EBI. And, you know, at least from what I've read on your on your policies, it seems like you're geared towards saving the planet from existential risk and like, you know, if we exacerbate this thing, you know, it doesn't, you know, robots are not like we're going to we're going to fuck the planet up. And we're not going to have a place to live. Like, how do you sell people like me or tree huggers, climate activists, activists, you know, whatever on the idea of just saying, fuck it, go for it, like do whatever you want. We're not going to be around in 100 years anyway. Well, I, I think you if you believe that we're not going to be around in 100 years then I think that really does change your perspective because you're not worrying. You know, everyone right now is like, oh, wow, the sea levels are rising. You know, by 2100, the sea levels are going to be up two or three feet. <clears throat> you know, it's like, hey, like, <laughs> what, what real difference does that make? Do you think America can't build a two-foot wall around itself? I mean, come on, we're, we're a multi, multi-trillion dollar economy. It's just like I heard this story recently about Newport, and they were talking about, uh, you know, building a little bit of a wall. And Newport is some of the most expensive real estate in the country. And they were talking about a few million dollars to do this wall to keep out the rising ocean. And I thought, my God, you know, th th there's 50,000 properties there and each one is worth $5 million. And you're worried about $2 million. The point I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> from an environmental point of view, we can tackle these things with brand new types of engineering skills, brand new types of geoengineering where we can control the climate. We have all sorts of brand new nanotechnology things coming down the pipeline. Through genetic editing, we are starting to regrow uh, plants already twice as fast. There's a very good chance that within 10 years, we will regrow rainforest hundreds of times faster than we can now. And probably within a whole year, you can get mature forests. We're going to recreate planet Earth in a way that makes it as beautiful as it's ever been in probably 25 years time, just because the technology that we have developed, we don't need to worry about destroying a little bit of it right now. And let me just give you an example. So <clears throat> I used to work as a communications director at Wild Aid, which is one of the largest wildlife organizations um, in Southeast Asia that does really good work on anti-poaching. And we would basically stop poaching in China and Vietnam and Southeast Asia and Cambodia and places like that. Now, 20 years ago when I was doing this job, I guess about 15 years ago, we would go out there like with our rifles and stuff like that because we, we would hire militia, Cambodian like um, uh, royal militia to come with us and protect animals, tigers and different types of, you know, Siamese crocodiles that were on the endangered list. Now, it turns out though, that 15 years later, the best way to actually save the Siamese crocodile has nothing to do with protecting it from poaching. It has to do with going to a laboratory and 
you know, taking its blood and doing the Jurassic Park thing and then releasing a few hundred of them into a river and then going to the next river and doing the same thing. And then all of a sudden, the Siamese crocodile populations be replenished. That's how technology has even changed the poaching industry dramatically. And over the next 10 or 20 years, when they talk about losing a species, there's no more losing a species anymore on planet Earth. If we, if we have a sample of its blood, it's just more a matter of recreating it later in, in, you know, in, in a vat and in, in a laboratory. The way we're going to save planet Earth is not through lessening our carbon footprint and it's not through trying to be greener. It's going to be through new technologies that l allow us to kind of reestablish a pristine environment. And that's, of course, if we want to remain on Earth. But by the time some of those technologies come, you know, we'll probably already have brain implants, robotic arms, things like that. Our version of what it means nature is will be very different. You know, we, we may actually not want to be so close to, you know, uh, I guess, greenery, vegetation and things like that. Our worlds will be so much more complex. We've tied into a hive mind, into AI, into the different types of virtual worlds that are out there. I mean, I don't know if, how much time you spent in Second Life, but once you get out there, I mean, you can do anything. And I think people are going to spend their existences there rather than, you know, in a forest somewhere far away, you know, wherever it is. I mean, you know, you make a compelling case. I'm not fully sold yet, but if I can offer you a point of advice, I'd say lead with the technology bit. You know, make it so that your priorities would be around creating and developing these technologies that would reverse a lot of the damage done so that it can make more sense for us to let go of some of it. I think that would be a, a stronger sell in that respect. But I don't want to stay too long on this. You know, we're mostly, uh, you know, uh, if you may know, uh, uh, kind of a foreign policy uh, uh, podcast here. We talk a lot about foreign intervention. We talk a lot about the different wars. Um, and we got asked, you know, because we were doing a bit of research and we didn't find too much on the foreign policy front. So, you know, I, I want to leave this a little bit open ended for you. You know, what are some of the things that you would bring to the table as president on the foreign policy side? Well, you know, I, I've said this again and again, and I guess if you were to ask me what's the main part of my platform, I would say is to significantly reduce military creation of bombs, weapons, anything that's done out of the idea of defense and turn it into science and technology for the benefit of human beings. I want to, instead of a military industrial complex, create a science industrial complex. I want to fight wars against diabetes, against heart disease, against cancer. I mean, heart disease is the number one killer in the world. Every, my dad died from heart, uh, heart attack. You know, I mean, everybody is affected by these kinds of things. And yet we're not tackling it. The president and the administration and the Congress because everyone's so, maybe it's because they're religious and they believe they're going to end up in Jesus's arms, or maybe it's because they just don't know. But I want to fight wars and eliminate disease for the common good of every American so that they don't have to die if they don't want to. And I want to take the huge amounts of military money that we have and put it towards those things. Now, I'm not saying I want to shut down the military. I wish Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and all these other companies, I don't want them to go out of business. What I'm saying is they need to change their approach. Let's make them into companies that are out to fight battles against Alzheimer's, something that really matters, or against obesity in America, something that's really taking down the country, rather than this far, far off, you know, policies. It's like, I've been to many of these countries, you know, uh, your listeners know, I've been to 100 plus countries, I've covered multiple war zones, I, I don't want Americans there, I don't want them fighting, let other people deal what they have to do, I take a very libertarian stance on this stuff. But my Americans, everybody that I meet on the campaign trail, these are people that have all been affected by cancer and heart disease and, and aging and the kinds of things that I think American government should really be out to, to tackle. And that means spending our military money on the common good. And I don't mean paying everyone's health care. I mean, it's the government's job, in my opinion, to end heart disease, to end cancer. These are just like enemies that are coming up on the sand and trying to kill us, you know, but... They are killing us. What can the country do instead of just letting pharmaceutical companies who may not have a vested interest in necessarily curing anything? The government should go out there and say, listen, I'm going to do something for America. I'm going to eliminate cancer, either through a vaccine or some other type of radical technology. That's something I want my government to do for me. I mean, I can't agree more with you on that. But, you know, what do you say to the war hawks out there that are like, just like how China's beating us in the technology game, 
you know, countries like China are going to go out and eat our lunch in the military game. And then they'll swoop in and stop us from ever being the science powerhouse that you dream, you know, the U.S. could be one day. Well, I, I think, you know, in terms of what I'm talking about, you know, China's already taken the avenue of saying, look, we want to become the leader in artificial intelligence in the world by 2030. You know, they're already leading, certainly, the world in genetic editing. And that means they're going to be potentially, you know, uh, augmenting children's brains so that in the next generation of Chinese are hardwired better than us because they have these, you know, they already seem to be hardwired better. But the bottom line is if they have some of these new technologies with genetic editing and they're able to figure out your brain to make it smarter in terms of engineering and stuff like that. And America doesn't want to touch that stuff because all of a sudden it's it's like we're too conservative. We don't want to change the human body. We have religious you know, re- reasons against it. It's very possible an entire Chinese generation could be smarter than us in a very genetic DNA kind of way. But beyond that, I mean, I think when you're talking about a science industrial complex, it's like going to the moon. If we as a country, America was to say, we're going to become a science industrial complex, all of a sudden, all these brand new inventions would come out of that kind of push. And I mean, a lot of money, a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity. And I think that alone is a better plan for taking on China than what Trump's doing right now. I mean, Trump's dreaming if he thinks he can just kind of make the military better when China is, you know, they have four times our population. Their economy is growing quite a bit uh, faster than ours. I mean, this is a country that's created something like 65 million jobs in five years. And we're creating a few million and we're, we're cheering and patting ourselves on the back. We can't compete against China in the way that we have been trying to compete in a capitalistic environment. The way to compete is to throw a Hail Mary pass and innovate the hell out of planet Earth. And that means enter the transhumanist age, become something very different. Because the singularity, and when you talk about transhumanism and cyborgism, and especially artificial intelligence, this is not something that we know how it's going to end up. We're not sure who the winners are. But I can tell you one thing, we know who the winner is right now between America and China moving forward 20 years. It's China. There's just really no question about it. Unless there's a major war started tomorrow, it's China. You know, and they're going to beat us economically, culturally. They're going to start to, you know, infiltrate our, our ranks and become more Chinese. And they're going to we're going to have probably a social credit system and all these. other. Oh, things. we already have that. They already yeah. have that. <laughs> so I, I'm significantly worried about China. I don't want to live under that type of authoritarian regime. The way I think America keeps its greatness is really by just saying, here's a Hail Mary pass. Let us put all our eggs into radical, radical innovation. And that's going to mean AI, genetic editing, the brain implants that allow us to use machine interface. Because once we, if we could win the AI arms race, for example, there's no way that we can ever lose. Once you have the greatest AI, you just can send out viruses, you know, to every other AI in the world and you sort of win. I mean, that's why, as Putin said, whoever wins that race wins domination of the world. So If it was me as president, I would say, how much money can we spend without bankrupting America on AI development and these other radical technologies so that no matter what happens, even if China makes more, you know, does better than us in terms of commerce and things like that, we have them beat in the things that really make a real difference in global security, in in kind of keeping the the geopolitical landscape in in a democratic way. And I think AI and genetic editing and these other things are the way to do that. I think they're the only way to do that. You certainly can't build enough cars or or build enough smartphones to to offset what's happening with China. We're, we're done for it. It's it you know ter- ter- the idea of tariff war is just like a joke. Like that's not how you beat China. That's how you get voted in 2020. It's not how you beat mm. China. Mm. Well, so so to, to recap that, you know, just quickly, what I heard was pull out a foreign intervention, let them figure it out. Uh, reduce the size of the military because we can be using that money towards building the the technology of the future, things like the AI, the automation, the robots, all of that. Um, And that's what we do on foreign policy because that's a better way to, you know, combat some of our, um, you know, let's say, uh, not adversaries, but <laughs> well, I mean, friendly if you, uh, neighbors. Yeah, if you, if you, can be the, if yeah. you can be the leader in crypto security, you don't need bullets and bombs and all this other stuff. I mean, it, you, you just simply be able to, you know, and as you probably know from foreign policy now, what we did with Iran recently in the nuclear facility. I mean, the new way of warfare doesn't involve, you know, 
as much soldiers. It really involves just sending different things across the internet and some stuff holds, some stuff doesn't. You can, if you can turn off someone's power and their light grid and you can turn off the water systems, I mean, you could inflict serious, serious damage without actually even killing anyone. And it, it's actually a very interesting new world with cybersecurity. And I think if it's up to me, that's where I would be spending all, and this is again, kind of the cybersecurity is all part of the autumn, you know, bionic hearts. It's all part of the, the new other transhumanist world too. They're all interconnected, but it's very different than bullets. Bullets is- Well, Trump has his space force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I mean, I, I actually, actually like the space that. Force. I think, I think that's yeah. a good idea. It's just, you know, I don't know <laughs> if, if, if he really means it. It might just be something he's just saying. You know, I don't know if he has any interest in real space and, you know, sending people up and getting us off planet, especially from an existential point of view. I'd love to, to, to re-get NASA going and get, you know, intermix it with private space industry. I mean, I love that stuff. That's all very transhumanist. Uh, from I what think I read, saw it off a lunchbox or something like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, from what I read, it's it's mostly like you know space defense, like you know anti missile systems, uh, anti satellite missile systems, and like you know uh, our GPS systems, and like maybe on the off chance like shooting an asteroid out of the space so it doesn't blow us up, you know. But mostly, I think that's what they're looking for. Um, Zoltan, we're we're uh, we're coming up on an hour here, um, so I want to you know kind of change it up a little bit maybe ask a couple your opinions on a few of the the current events that are going on uh just to make it fun and we'll close it out so um you're running as a republican against trump but uh we're recording this on tuesday it looks like this week we're going to be voting on impeachment what do you think uh what's going on there where's your head at with uh with impeachment look i mean i just think the democrats are being babies just like they were with you know brett kavanaugh i mean they're, they're i don't I'm not sure that that's necessary to do for against Trump. I think um, if you really want to beat him, you ought to beat him with a nominee that can, um, you know, beat him, a Democratic nominee. But, you know, I'm obviously not going to win against Trump, even though I'm on a number of state ballots. Uh, I'm really running because the idea is that I'm trying to make Republicans uh, a better party, <laughs> you know, hopefully more open minded, a little bit more technology and get Republicans thinking in a different way. I think that's a very, um, you know, important goal. Uh, naturally, I would love to um, be elevated to a person who could actually challenge Trump, but that's that's in no way going to happen. And I'm not uh, I'm not someone who actually, lo- you know, ends up bashing Trump all day long either. I, I think there are some things he's done well and other things that he hasn't. I wish there was more professionalism he would bring to the presidency. But at the same time, I mean, I'm not sure the, the Democrats have acted very professionally either any anymore. But, you know, re- impeachment's not important. What I think's important is, you know, America gets his head in the game in terms of beating China and, and really sort of entering into the, the transhumanist age without the far left owning it. I, I have an important question. What is your favorite science fiction book? Oh, uh, <laughs> let, oh, let me think about that. Or it could be movie. It could <laughs> yeah. be movie or TV well, show. Any I, any I think type of in, in movie. I'm so boring because it, it's really Matrix. So my 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 history is <laughs> that in, at, at college <laughs> I studied. My senior thesis was done on brains in a vat, which is exactly that concept. How can you prove that you're not? Um, you know, just being manipulated by some scientists in some far off planet. And honestly, that's Rene Descartes for you right there. Yeah, you, you, you can't really prove it. It's just so that's always been my favorite concept. So I'd have to say The Matrix is uh, is is definitely my uh, my favorite. The the original Matrix is a masterpiece. I watched it late. I watched it like a couple of months ago. And the original, the first Matrix, I was just wow, this thing is better now than it was when it came out. Yeah, no, there's a new one coming ago. too. It's amazing how good it is. Amazing. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. great. Um, so we're we're coming over that hour. Um, where can where can uh, people find your website? Where can they find your campaign? Support you? Donate? Um, how do how do people who are listening support you? Yeah, well, uh, donations are always appreciated. We're always running low. Um, look, my website is zoltan twenty twenty dot com. At zoltan twenty twenty, I have my personal website, which is still up at zoltan dot com. So if you want to see some of the other interviews like with Joe Rogan or Dave Rubin or whatever, or Fox news, whatever it's all out there um, as well to look at. And um, you know, I've also written over 225 articles. So if you just want to Google any topic like artificial wombs, Zoltan Ishwan, and that was at the New York times. 
and you know have a whole bunch of other articles on smaller taxes on robots taking over on whether capitalism will sur survive on the singularity on aliens i mean i, I write about everything and i've uh, you know the great thing about my life is has been being a journalist and writing about a lot of strange and weird stuff so just google uh, google and you'll find uh, certainly an article that i wrote in major media that's awesome. Zoltan, thank you so much uh, for you know spending an hour out of your day while you're on the campaign uh, for president. Uh, again, that's Zoltan2020.com. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, it's been great talking to you guys. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.